What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back with my spoiler-free review for Late Night with the Devil, which I just saw at the Alamo Draft House in downtown Brooklyn. The movie goes into wide release next Friday, and if you are a fan of the horror genre, I'm going to recommend that you check it out. But I'm going to I'm going to try and tap the brakes and not like you know immediately proclaim that this is some sort of new horror masterpiece. Although it will be definitely making my uh, top ten list at the end of the year. It's going to be a strong contender. But the star himself, David Dustmalchen, if I'm saying his last name correctly, he was there in attendance. And I tend to get a little starstruck whenever I see like the cast and crew or the directors. And I don't want that to, like, I don't want that to be a kind of an overweight consideration when assessing the strengths and weaknesses of this movie. But I was really fucking into it. I went into it with pretty high expectations, and I was pretty much riveted for like. 95% of it, like as I kept thinking to myself, I really wish this was like a real talk show that I could watch on a regular basis because I stopped watching talk shows right around 1991 for whatever reason. Once I went off to um, high school, college, etc., just I was dumb, dumb, dumb with talk shows, but I remember the era of, you know, the, like the end of Johnny Carson's run as well as David Letterman, Arsenio Hall, all those talk show figures from that period. And I always liked how late night things would get a little weird, a little uncertain, like, oh, who's like the C guest, the D guest, the E guest? Like, will they actually bring on somebody with a little girl to show them, like, you know, suffering from demonic possession and that sort of thing? And this movie does a brilliant job of kind of tapping into that. And so people are already kind of drawing comparisons between this and Network, which I think is a mistake because Network was a satire and uh, it's one of the best movies ever made. Forget the 1970s. Network is one of the best movies ever made, period. And if people want to say, I think it's the best movie ever made, I don't agree, but I'm not going to give them any pushback at all. I think it's a true like media masterpiece and it just skewers all these TV personalities that were coming into being in the 70s. So it was considered like too broad and too over the top back then, but as we've seen with uh, cable television and now YouTube, et cetera, and so forth, it was only the, uh, the the beginning. We had to crawl before we walked and now before we run. And so yeah, the whole world is full of talk show personalities like was predicted in network. But I don't want to get sidetracked about network. Let's stay focused on Late Night with the Devil because it's also drawing comparisons to Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist. And I think those comparisons are unfortunately inevitable because you can tell it's very heavily we can tell those two classics, had a, a profound influence on some of the lore and kind of backdrop as well as some of the practical effects that we see in the movie. But apart from that, this is just a groundbreaking, kick-ass original horror film, and I just loved it to pieces. Also, some keen-eyed observers might be noticing that my left eye is looking a little funky. No, nobody, nobody caught me with a right hook going to and from the theater. I'm in the second day of a pretty gnarly eye infection. It doesn't really look like much. But I basically feel like I have this, like, this giant marble kind of embedded in my eyelid. And it's super painful, but everybody's, uh, not everybody, a lot of people have criticized me for having a cheap setup and a crummy camera. This is one situation where it's nice to have low resolution because I don't have to worry about people, you know, picking out the details of all the, the ooze as it comes out. But who knows, maybe one of these days I'll do a special video where when I get a good camera, I'll devote an entire video to all my physical abnormalities and deformities and scars and things like that. And slowly but surely... Do a little show and tell. I am kidding, of course. But anyway, so that's why my left eye is looking a little funky. And one ingredient that was just so satisfying to watch was seeing David Dasmalchian, you know, basically becoming a leading man. I first saw him, like most people, as one of the Joker's henchmen in The Dark Knight. And I remember at the time thinking, whoa, that dude's really spooky and creepy. Like, I wonder if we'll ever see him again. And then sure enough, as a character actor, he just kept popping up over the last 15, 16 years. And now I've gotten to the point where he's worked with Denny Villeneuve multiple times. He's worked with Christopher Nolan multiple times. Like he's kind of very quietly flying under the radar as this really cool character actor who works with people like James Gunn. I mean, the polka dot man might be my favorite role of him to date until Late Night with the Devil. But it's always a, a pleasure when you see somebody kind of graduate from really cool, sinister, eerie, disturbing character actor to a full-blown leading man who can carry a movie all by his, lo all by his lonesome. And ordinarily, I'm not that into uh, Q&As after screenings. I'm ready to kind of get home, do my video, and play video games and that sort of thing. But I stayed for the, uh, for the entirety of the Q&A. And sadly, Josh Horowitz never called on me to, so that I could ask a question. I think he very w willfully and deliberately was uh, ignoring his peripheral vision, and I was sitting off to the side. But it was a pleasure hearing David Dasmalchian. Every time I say his name, I'm checking my notes. I'm like, am I saying it correctly? I looked up how to pronounce it. I I'm just going to call him by his uh, character name, and his character name is... Do, 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 do... Jack Delroy, the great Jack Delroy, who is now officially my favorite talk show host. 
and you get you get you get this moment for a fleeting second. You know, you spend years uh, building to a moment like this, and then you just get it's it goes so quickly. So I try to savor it as much as possible. So I was like, I, I'm just, this I just want to go. I want to hide in the back and just <laughs> and just feel the energy. And you guys were such an awesome audience, and it was. Um, that's a really good feeling. So thanks, everybody. That was amazing. And what was great about the Q&A, first and foremost, David is really good on the mic. He only needs like one or two questions, and he can just go and go and go. I mean, he's, he's, not, he's an actor. He's performing. But he's a great raconteur. He's a great storyteller. And he definitely helped like kind of set the tone when he was describing how when he was young, he liked like late night horror talk show hosts, like people that were introducing weird, obscure horror movies like on, on a channel he'd never heard of. But there's one... He grew up in Kansas City that he was particularly devoted to. And so he was almost trying to kind of channel his love and affection for those weird, strange, late-night talk show hosts from the 1980s into this movie. And it totally works. But also, he was like geeking out about his love of people like David Cronenberg and John Carpenter and Toby Hooper and a lot of horror icons. Like there were very few kind of unexpected classics that he mentioned. Although he did mention one or two obscure classics that I um, that I had not heard of because he was talking about the found footage horror subgenre, which obviously goes back, I mean, you can, it officially got underway, well, I guess it varies depending upon who you're talking to. I always think of Cannibal Holocaust, but it's like anytime you say such and such movie was the first of this, then someone's like, but what about, what do I call it? Like, I'm, I'm sure the same holds true with uh, found footage horror movies. In a lot of ways, Night of the Living Dead almost feels like a found footage horror movie. In any case, this is a found footage horror movie, but I feel like it almost kind of reduces the movie and its scope or its style or its impact by, because when you say found footage, you immediately think, oh, yet another stupid Jason Blum, Blumhouse, cookie cutter, formulaic, bullshit horror movie. Just think of it as like like the coolest talk show, like hour of late night TV that you've ever seen. But when they break for commercials, you get to see some cool kind of grainy black and white footage of them behind the scenes interacting and basically putting out all the fires that you typically have to put out when you're um, conducting uh, a show in that format. But getting back to David, you could tell that he loves the horror genre. He loves working in that genre. He respects the history, but also recognizes that you have to take it into new places, into new terrain. And he just seemed to really like savor the experience of getting this opportunity to be the leading man in a cool horror movie. And there are not a lot of actors who ever get that opportunity where they can basically kind of, you know, run the show on a cool horror film. And he showed up for the movie and he sat in the back because he said he just wanted to savor the experience of watching an audience watching it for the first time and hearing out the laughs and the screams and that sort of thing. And this is definitely one of those horror movies you want to see with a crowd. It's not one of those movies where, where people are going to be like, jumping out of their seats because I don't think there was a single jump scare the entire movie. One of the things that separates it from a trashy Blumhouse movie, no jump scares. Jump scares, I feel like they're the most gimmicky, cheap shortcut a filmmaker can rely upon imaginable where they don't have the skill or the talent to create the effect that they want. So they cheat and they, t they take a shortcut. There is a scene in this movie where it felt like, like the world's greatest cobweb was all over the back of my body and just someone went and lifted it. I was like, oh! Oh my lord like I'm used to chills and all that kind of stuff when watching movies but there's a creepy little moment that all I'll say is that it involves a hand coming down, down on the shoulder and I'm getting chills even remembering I was like oh that was so well done that was so effective so it's just as a fan of the genre it was a real thrill to have that emotional experience watching this flick but I just realized I've been ranting and raving like a crazy person without saying a single thing about who made this or what it is. So here's the official description from over on Wikipedia. Late Night with the Devil is a 2023 found footage horror film written, directed, and edited by Australian siblings Cameron and Colin Cairns, Keynes, C-A-I-R-N-E-S, you tell me. An executive produced by Joel Anderson, Rami Yassin, and David Das Malchin. Very cool. He's one of the producers. An international co-production of Australia and the United Arab Emirates, Late Night with the Devil, had its world premiere at the South by Southwest Film Festival on March 10th, 2023, and received generally positive reviews from critics. But the official log line from everyone on IMDb is real simple. A live television broadcast in 1977 goes horribly wrong, unleashing evil into the nation's living rooms. Yeah, they... Um, they do a great job of kind of setting the stage and showing how he rose to prominence as a talk show host in the early 70s and how his show is slowly but surely losing popularity. And he's really desperate to uh, try to get like climb back higher in the ratings and start competing with people like Johnny Carson again. And so he's dating like a paranormal psychologist or researcher who's writing a book about her experiences 
you know, examining and looking after a girl who's the sole survivor of this horrible, like, I guess it was like an accident or a fire, some sort of atrocity where a whole bunch of devil worshipers who were conducting some ceremony, like you want to get little like bits and pieces and flashes, but in any case, the sole survivor, if the mood strikes her, occasionally speaks in voices and that sort of thing, and she's nice and creepy. So bringing her on live television is going to hopefully be the, uh, the solution to all the ratings woes of the great Jack Delroy. And he devotes the whole evening to the supernatural, having like fortune tellers and, you know, uh, mediums and skeptics and hypnotists and all these different people coming on, kind of offering their different points of view on supernatural phenomena and that sort of thing. And so, yeah, like I said, I wish I could watch a talk show like that on any given night. They did a fantastic fucking job. And the crew, the, the personalities on the stage are absolutely fucking hilarious. They're fantastic. When you see how just with almost like, military efficiency. The way they run the show behind the scenes is, is, is an absolute thrill to watch. And during the Q&A, David Dostmalchian Dost, Dost was saying that the real crew for the movie had to dress in period attire, and that way they accidentally pick, got picked up by a camera. They would just look like they're part of the show. And I thought that was really cool, where you basically have a film crew and a television crew working side by side, but only, you know, only one crew's cameras are actually turned on. So what can we say without giving anything away? What's cool about the, uh, the story as it unfolds, because you've got skeptics or cynics who want to kind of disprove or poke holes in some of the ideas of some of the people that are like true believers in this stuff, and then you have the people who are like, look, I'm not a true believer, I'm a scientist, like I'm studying this stuff, but it's, it's, you get some interesting different points of view, and there's this great internal tension on the stage because all Jack Delroy wants is a good episode of television. He wants some crazy shit to go down, and he wants everybody to put their best foot forward, and he wants everybody to have a turn to kind of skewer the other person's point of view. But meanwhile, uh, like, you know, things start to escalate. And little subtle phenomena at first, whether that's like a little bit of static in the camera or like a piece of equipment malfunctioning, starts to escalate. And I think the movie, this is gonna sound like a, a criticism, but I think it's like 95% effective in kind of ratcheting up the tension, escalating the tension. And at the very end of the movie, if you wanted to say perhaps they took it one step too far and went a little over the top in terms of just like how big the climax is and what special effects are employed, I would probably side with that point of view, but I was so satisfied throughout so much of it, I was willing to kind of cut it some slack if like the tension or the spell was a little bit broken in the final few minutes because it employs so many brilliant practical effects without saying what the effects are or what the gross, disgusting kind of... I guess, uh, images on display in the film. There's a moment where they're doing it, with it where, when they shot it. They shot it in a practical fashion. And according to David Dasmalchian, he said, just being able to smell the special effects while the scene was unfolding and being able to see it with his naked eye, he just said it, just, it informed his whole approach as an actor. And he was not bashing CGI. He's worked on some Marvel movies. He's been in the Ant-Man movies and that sort of thing. He's been in situations where somebody's wearing like a green suit and you're basically told, oh, their head's exploding, react. And he says, we are actors, we play make-believe, like we work with our imaginations. He's more than capable of doing that. And he's capable of doing Tennessee Williams at like his local theater while growing up in the Midwest. He's an actor, he's got range. But he said just it was a great tool as an actor. If you can smell the special effects in a horror movie as you're reacting to it, it just helps imbue your performance with so much more reality and authenticity. And speaking of reality, what I really appreciated was how it didn't overdo it when it came to the 70s attire, the 70s hairdos, like the needle drops. Like usually when people make movies set in the 70s, they're like, oh my God, now we can do all the bell bottoms and crazy hairdos that you, you could ever you know, want, blah, blah, blah. This movie, it's set in the 70s and it feels like the 70s, but it wasn't like um, kind of a, a nausea inducing exercise in 70s nostalgia or anything like that. It was really like, you could tell they were trying to recreate an era and they brought in fucking Michael Ironside to play one particular role, which really helps kind of sell you on the backdrop and the lore because like the first five or 10 minutes of the movie was like, oh my God, like this is like a, a ton of information that is being fed to us, but it's being fed to us in such a, an entertaining fashion because you have to know about some of the supernatural occurrences within the context of the story, but you also have to know the backdrop of this talk show host and where these two worlds intersect. 
And Michael Ironside, I mean, Jesus Christ, he's been a, a hero to filmmaking for a very long time. I mean, nobody's ever going to forget him in Scanners or friggin' uh, Starship Troopers. I mean, the list goes on and on. Or Total Recall. I mean, Michael Ironside is a goddamn legend. But it was just it was so cool hearing that voice. And it really helps just uh, get this movie off on the, uh, on the perfect foot. But another actor that I thought was fucking amazing was Ingrid Torelli, who plays the young Lily. She's incredible. You can tell... She's like a teenage girl who's in love with talk show hosts and TV and that sort of thing, and she always knows exactly how to look into the camera. But you can also tell she comes from a very strange background where she was quite literally raised by devil worshippers who like have ceremonies when they're like you know making pacts with demonic demonic entities in exchange for power, wealth, fame, etc. And for a um, for a very young performer to be able to kind of convince you that she's got these years of trauma and all this horrible history, while at the same time still acting like a teenage girl who's excited to be on the show. She absolutely nailed it, and uh, she got a little uh, kind of, I guess, like technological assistance when it comes to showing her possessed side, but everybody's going to wonder, like, can she hold a candle to the actresses? And of course, nobody can. Like, nobody will ever be able to make a movie about possession ever again without being unfavorably compared to the actresses because it's one of the greatest horror films ever made. I fucking love that movie. But Ingrid Torelli... She sold me. She was fucking fantastic. Uh, Reese Otteri as kind of the wingman slash butt of the many of uh, Jack Delroy's jokes. He's fantastic as well. He reminded me a lot of uh, Ed McMahon on uh, the Johnny Carson show. But uh, yeah, he was absolutely extraordinary. Also, I have to give a special shout out to actor Ian Bliss, who's so goddamn goodness, he almost threatens to kind of unbalance the movie and run away with the show. In, in the end... He's a great member of an incredible ensemble cast, but he's so talented and his character is so well, well written and he's so many great scenes. You're like, Jesus Christ, like, can we get another movie just about this guy? But anyway, shout out to Ian Bliss. He was fucking incredible. But in the end, I think the best praise I can give to this movie is that I was just completely, totally invested. I wasn't sitting back and thinking, oh, that was an interesting special effect. Oh, that was an interesting transition between those two scenes. Like I stopped looking at it analytically and I was just getting sucked into this crazy story. And while a few plot details or ingredients, you, if, you're a, if you're a horror devotee or devotee, I never quite know how to say that word, but if you're in a horror and uh, a horror enthusiast, well then, um, yeah, you've, you've kind of been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Like, you know all the tricks that the, the genre has to offer, but it did feel so fresh and so damn entertaining. It felt a lot like a great midnight movie. It was an 8 p.m. screening, but it had the vibe and the energy and kind of the, um, kind of the bubbling tension in the crowd. It's like, here are a bunch of drunk maniacs who've gotten together at midnight to watch a fucked up movie. And the movie's not that fucked up. It's just really entertaining, really effective. I hope this movie finds an audience. Uh, these two directors from Australia... Uh, I've never seen any of their other movies, but I'm going to start hunting down some of their past work. But yeah, Australian horror, I feel like starting in the late 70s when the whole kind of uh, Ozploitation phenomenon really took off. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out the documentary, uh, Not Quite Hollywood, one of the best documentaries ever made. And it covers all the, the great genre films being made in Australia in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. But they've always had this incredible tradition in the horror genre. And last year, obviously, we had Talk to Me, which was fantastic. And now we've got Late Night with the Devil. Bring it on. Um, yeah, the more the more Ozploitation, the more Aussie horror that we have in our diet, the happier I'll be. So I think that's about all I can say before getting into trouble with spoilers. So I just hope that I've made a case for the film and that people will give it a shot next week. But in closing, I'll just ask the question that I wanted to ask of David Dasmalchin that I did not get a chance to during the Q&A. I was just going to give him some praise, say, look, you've had the, the good fortune to work with a lot of good directors like Christopher Nolan, Denny Villeneuve, James Gunn, who would you like to work with next? Because I think his days of being exclusively a character actor are over. I don't know if he'll ever be, you know, friggin' Timothy Chalamet. That's just maybe not in the cards. He's just a little too unusual. I mean, even his body posture and body language will be an interview. He's like kind of all hunched up. He, he's a weird dude, but he is charming as hell. He's got amazing chops, amazing range, amazing intensity. And I think he could be one of those guys like, John Turturro or Tim Roth, one of those actors where you just, you know, or um, Steve Buscemi or Christopher Walken, these actors where they're character actors who periodically get their own show or get their own movie, but they always, like, they're, they're never going to be Robert Redford, Robert Redford or Brad Pitt or something like that, but I, uh, I think the sky is the limit, and I hope the best is yet to come in his career, but at this point, 
I'm officially uh, ram- rambling my head off. It's time to rack- wrap this sucker up. It is uh, nearly midnight here in New York, and I'm ready to uh, play some Elden Rings. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell, and I hope that uh, people will enjoy this movie when they see it next week, and I look forward to hearing people's uh, reactions in the comments below. But thanks again for watching, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.